Welcome everyone back to the channel. My name is Paul. I'm very happy to be here anonymous, and I'm really pleased to be joined today by Eden. Hello everyone. My name is Eden, and I'm an addict. Um, welcome back to the channel and to anyone new to K Anonymous to Recovery, please check out the other broadcasts. We've got about three dozen on here. Uh, there's one on each of the 12 steps as an introduction to CA. Um, there's one on the ABCs of addiction, the spiritual malady, an entire psychic change and about eight personal stories. So please check those out. Um, during this broadcast, I'll be putting up different information on the screen, including information on how to get to meetings both face to face and on zoom bear in mind you can pause and rewind this podcast at any time please feel free to distribute it um, feel free to get involved in the conversation wherever you see this posted on skype or in the rooms.com uh, whatsapp or indeed here on youtube so without further ado i'm really really pleased that eden's going to be sharing with us his experience strength and hope um yeah so over to you Brilliant. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's it's lovely to be back. And, uh, you know, obviously I'm, well, not obviously to you guys, but, um, you know, I'm here again um, because uh, Paul asked me to come along and uh, share, as it just so happened, um, that I was six years uh, clean and sober as of yesterday. And uh, it's a funny feeling, really, because um, I was reminded of a story about a man who got one year uh, clean and sober and he got his year chip and he went and he was very pleased with himself and he said to his mum, he said, mum, I haven't touched a drink or a drug for a whole year. And his mum said, so what? Neither is the dog. Right. And it, it really grounds me that story because it's a strange idea for me to be celebrating not doing something that I shouldn't have been doing in the first place for the 25 years before that. Um, but I suppose what it does qualify me to do is talk about what a life in recovery after six years looks like. And uh, so I'm not saying that, you know, people should aspire to be like me. No, no, far, far from that, um, because I, I've often said to newcomers, actually, uh, you don't want my recovery. You want yours. And I'm happy to help you, you know, go and get it. Um, I mean, there are the practical things, of course. Um, you know, like I'm sitting here now, right? I'm sitting here now. I've got a sharp haircut. I've got new trainers. My bills are paid. I've got enough money in the bank to cover next month's bills. My home is clean and orderly. I do yoga classes. I run 20 miles a week. I eat well. Um, me and a 14 other guys from CA, we all did a charity parachute jump recently. You know, I, I take my kids on little hotel breaks during the school holidays. Um, you know, the last time I picked my kids up, my ex-wife said to me, oh, Aidan, um, the kids are, you know, the girls are really desperate for school shoes and I haven't had time to take them. And I can just say, yeah, that's fine. We can fit that in. No problem. And, you know, they, they just just that stuff, that stuff just happens. That life part's really easy, you know, and. If we're eating in a restaurant or something, you know, my kids can say to me at the end of the meal, um, Dad, can we have a pudding and hot chocolate? And I can go, yeah, sweetie, you can have a pudding and hot chocolate. It's absolutely fine. You know, I'm not looking at my watch, wondering how much money they're spending, wondering if the deal is going to be in. You know what I mean? I need to get going. It's just totally relaxed around that stuff. And, you know, not so long ago, me and a mate from CA, we, we took some downtime. And we just went for a back massage. We had a few frames of pool, you know, went out for a curry. Um, you know, I mean, that's my life, you know, just, just two days ago. Um, there was me, my sister, my mum, my kids, my sister's kids. We all went to the West End, took in a show. And, you know, we had afternoon tea in a hotel, you know. And a month ago, we were at the Royal Albert Hall doing exactly the same thing, you know. I've reconnected with a career that I love and I can be depended upon to do it consistently and reliably. And this week, you know, from this afternoon, 
I'm babysitting uh, for my sister's kids for three days and nights while her and her husband go away. And I'm trusted to, to do that. And I found that the world for an addict in recovery is not a bad place to be. Um, being a recovered or recovering addict, it really doesn't have the shame and the stigma attached to it that it once did. Um, or, I, or I reckoned it did, or I felt like it might have done when I, uh, when I came into recovery. Um, you see, like, look, I can't, actually, I don't, I don't know, I, I can't believe I'm gonna tell you this actually, but it, it's, it'll get there, right? Um, I've, I've got a mate, Dan, okay, and uh, he's got type one diabetes. And we have such a laugh, like comparing our afflictions, um, because we've, you know, we've both got potentially life-threatening conditions that require constant maintenance. So there's quite a lot of crossover for us to be able to chat about. And he, he said to me, look, ah, you've got such a trendy illness. Like all the best celebrities have got what you've got. And I just said, oh yeah, mate, you know, that, that's why I chose it. You know, I'm just jumping on the zeitgeist. And, uh, you know, and, and, I, and, I, you know, and I'm teasing him. I'm saying to him, yeah, but, you know, society loves you. Like you get all the sympathy in the world. There are laboratories full of, you know, scientists working on stuff that might be able to cure you. Whereas most conservative voters would lobotomize me you know, if they had the chance. And we're just, you know, we're just laughing about this stuff. And and and, and he said, yeah, well, he goes, yeah, but your illness doesn't have any symptoms. You see, uh, and I said, yeah, but, um, you know, if, if you don't look after yourself, right, then your body just gives up and, you know, you kind of quietly slip away. Like, if I don't look after myself, right, I will take all the drugs I can possibly lay my hands on. I'll jump on the roulette wheel and I'll sleep with hookers until it kills me. You see, and my mate Dan, just at that point, he just looked down at the table and I thought, oh, no, Eden, you know, you've taken it too far. You know, that, that what you've just said there, that was way too graphic for a conversation over a mid-morning hot buttered scone, you know. And, uh, and then when my mate Dan, he, he looked up and he looked at me and he, and he said, I tell you what, when the time comes, you can die of my illness and I'll die of yours, right? And we just, and we just, you know, we just had an absolute scream about that, you know, and I found that people are, uh, you know, just way more tolerant and forgiving if, um, you know, it's sort of given that, um, that, that credit of, um, you know, of being a genuine illness and, and a condition. And I found that the world isn't as, isn't as, cruel and judgmental towards me as I uh, as I thought it might be I mean there are things that bother me um you know it's like sometimes uh you know you'll hear if I say to someone that I'm in recovery or, or, or that I'm a recovered addict let's say and uh, and they might come back with um oh yes uh, I've got a bit of an addictive personality and uh, and I really want to, you know, my instincts sometimes, you know, I, I prickle a little bit sometimes with that because I really want to say to them, no, look, I'm sorry, you know, uh, you telling me you've got a bit of an addictive personality is like going up to a below the knee amputee and telling them about the time you twisted your ankle. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, we're not, we're not on the same, we're not on the same spectrum. It's not the same thing, you know, just, just if, if you open a packet of biscuits and, you know, it, you, you can't stop yourself finishing them, that's, that's not the same as what, as what I've gone through, you know, like no one's really 
you know, been curtain twitching at four o'clock in the morning and gone down the 24 hour garage to draw money out of their credit card to then pay a dealer, you know, because they can't put down the custard creams, you know, it's just, it's not the same thing. But I don't say that kind of thing to them because they don't deserve it, you know, and they're, they're well meaning, you know, but um, it's, you know, it's just one of them things. Um, but it, uh, thankfully, it does mean that addiction is is now seems to be societally like just regarded as an illness like many others, rather than um, you know addicts in recovery are just seen as people who were idiots or um, you know made stupid choices out of weakness. And um, you know, so I'm really grateful for all of that stuff. You know that I said. You know, I'm really grateful for all of that stuff that I said that I've, I've acquired um you know through the through the process of recovery when i when i started talking you know at the beginning of this um but that's just what my recovery looks like from the outside um you know the external stuff uh obviously that there's a galaxy of richness going on behind that which is just as significant if, if not more so um yeah, I'll get to that. I mean, and obviously I will get to that. I'll, I'll get to that later because, um, uh, you know, because it's worth saying that, you know, in the last in the last couple of years of my recovery and the first couple of years of, um, you know, in the last couple of years of my using and the first couple of years of my recovery, um, you know, I wasn't invited anywhere. You know, I was tolerated at best. Um, you know, that relationship I've had with my family you know where we were all going out together and babysitting each other's kids and you know having that normality I've earned that you know I've had to earn that back um you know my my, my family were disgusted with me for for being an addict um they were deeply ashamed that I needed help um and they're still a little bit disappointed that I continue to need help, if I'm being completely honest, but that's okay. My program does not require them to understand it, but they are coming to respect it and me, and we're heading in the right direction. Um, but at the time, you know, they would have rather I died, I think, than put them through the disgrace of rehab or prison. And that's where I was going had I not found CA. And uh, yeah, so this is this is where I wanted to go. Okay, this is this is where I wanted to go um, with this with this podcast. Is um, why I'm I'm dead chuffed. I'm really grateful to the, for the opportunity to be able to uh, to do this again because uh, I recorded my you know my life story a little bit um, on this um, on this channel uh, a few months ago, and. Uh, I concentrated really heavily on the um, on the condition and the consequences uh, in that in that podcast, and I don't make an apology for that. You know, it's a really it's a very frank and, um, and really you know it's an unabashed and pretty harsh portrait of what it's like to to be an addict. And I think that's important. You know, I wanted to do it that way because that was a share for someone that's coming in, you know, somebody that's new about or someone that's trying to get into it, um, trying to get into this recovery. Because if we're going to be telling people or saying to people that you need to invest in a spiritual path of a lifelong recovery, that before that, they need to know that we get it. You know, they need to know that to where I got today, I came from a place where I went to the gates of insanity. I've stood cheek by jowl with the angel of death. I've stared that bedevilment squarely in the face and I've made my way back. Because that's the hook. Because if they're coming in, chances are that's the sort of state of mind that they're in. And, um, but, but, however, I finished that last podcast somewhat hastily. Right. Uh, we, we were running out of time and uh, I started to flounder a little bit and um, I said something that I said something at the end of that podcast that hasn't sat right with me ever since. Um, what I said was, is I said I didn't know how come I'd got this program. And I also said that 
maybe uh, God decided that I'd suffered enough. And I think if I was to play that podcast to a room full of people who were in rehab in their second week, I'd sort of be all right with it. But the reason it, it, it doesn't sit right with me is one of these, it's actually not true. It's not really true. Um, I do know how I got into this program and I don't think it, it's because uh, God made any kind of intervention on my behalf. Um, and the reason that I'd like to look back over this is that I would not like to play that podcast back or this one to a group of parents who have lost a child to an overdose and have the conclusion be that God elected to save me and not their child. I would not like that. I would not like that one little bit. So I want to go back over this and say that my higher power saves me on a daily basis because I ask it to. And that's absolutely vital. I'm not, I'm not different. I'm not special. I wasn't selected. I'm not there. I'm not better or, you know, than anyone else. All it is is that I try through, you know, diligence and practice to access a power greater than myself. And uh, that power is available to absolutely anyone at any time. But it's up to me in this case, in my case, to use my free will in order to do that. And uh, I, I once heard someone say, um, you know, that God is a gentleman who doesn't show up uninvited. Um, and th there seems to be like a bit of on the outside, like a bit of an incorrect assumption that to embark upon a spiritual path, um, one has to relinquish some of your analytical faculties, right? And um, that somehow the, the idea of faith and evidence don't mix. And this is something that I've had to work through. Um, you know, that how can a non-religious person become assured in the grace of God, right? So, well, the way I see it is a little bit like this, right? Okay, so well, but don't right, rest easy. Okay, I'm not going to criticize any religion. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to change anyone's mind. You know, I'm only six years clean, so I reserve the right to keep learning and change my mind if I want to. Um, but this is where I found solace at the moment. Uh, okay, so we know so much about the universe and so little. Right. Take the speck of our solar system. We know that the planets and the astral bodies spin around in the way that they do because they're caught in the gravitational field provided by the sun. Just as we know that our material world is constructed of microscopic molecules with protons and electrons spinning around the nucleus. OK, that that comparison has been made many times. But what I'd like to ask is why? I mean, let's use the, the, the planet imagery because it's easier to work with. Why are they there? Is there a reason for their existence? Are they and all that performing a purpose? Is it possible that there is a reason and a purpose for why everything exists in the way that it does? Then. Reason and purpose are not accidents. They're provided by something, okay? So reason and purpose are not thoughts or feelings, they're universal constants, okay? We, we, don't, we don't say, do we, like, I, um, I feel like purpose. We, we say, I feel like I have a purpose. We say, like, we feel like we have been provided with something that came from outside of ourselves to invest our time and our energy in, and it's satisfying for us to work towards that something greater than the sum of our parts. So, right, if the, if the planets are there for a reason and with a purpose, and all the molecules in my body are spinning around and they have a reason and a purpose, then all I have to do is I just 
train my spirit to try and listen to what the my reason and purpose is and transmit those kind of glad tidings into my mind and then I have some sort of faith in the way things are meant to be and I'm not meant to be out there smashing myself to bits hurting everyone I love while slowly killing myself now atheists would kind of say well you know how dare you you know what I mean how dare I claim to be able to tap into the way things are supposed to be and receive orderly direction from a source of the universe you know I mean they could you know I mean look at the world look at the world you know um, we live in a world that has paedophile priests female genital mutilation thousands of babies die every day they don't even get a chance at life because of their environment terrorism capitalist greed um, a boat full of migrants capsizes and everyone drowns the last thing some poor bloke sees before being consumed by the waves himself is the bodies of his own children floating face down in the water and like in and that, that's happening now 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 in america there are you know mass graves filled every day by the lorry load of shoebox sized plywood coffins filled with the fetuses of miscarried and aborted pregnancies, three quarters of them are from drug addicts, right? And yet there are thousands of couples spending thousands of pounds on fertility treatment, begging God to bless them with a child, right? Now, I can see why an agnostic would get cross with me and say, if there's a way things are supposed to be, it looks like your God is asleep at the wheel, okay? I get it, all right, I do. But my higher power will only open me up to my reason and purpose, right? My God has no human qualities whatsoever, okay? Which on face value does not seem like a controversial statement, okay? But if you scratch beneath the surface of that, what that means is that it's not interested and it has no opinions. And I, I am willing to accept that, okay? There's a misnomer from those that don't believe in God and those of us that do, that somehow atheists, um, uh, you know, that, that somehow people like me who believe in God, right, that, that somehow we can anethanatize ourselves from the world's horror and justice. That's what people kind of think, you know, that we that we can explain it away. We can explain it away with a kind of, hey ho, fiddly dee, must be God's will. Okay, but that's not true in my case, because those horrors and injustices that I just went through, that I just described, okay, I don't believe that God had anything to do with those things. I think that they're a direct result of human choices, you know, or a regrettable use of free will, if you like. Now, recovery has given me a choice. I can either choose to use my free will to connect to the spirit of the universe or not. If I choose not, I'm stepping outside the program of recovery and I step away. And if I step away from the program, then my illness will return. The condition of addiction will wriggle free and I will use again. And if that's what if that is what happens, God will not try and stop me. And he won't be in the slightest bit bothered by the outcome. And there will be no red carpet welcome back if I decide to reconnect. But for me, it's better to be a spiritual being enjoying a human experience than a physical person living like an animal now what could what could influence me then to stop my recovery knowing everything that i know and the consequences of doing so well that jeopardy is not always in the obvious like you would think that addicts would be triggered by the big things you know like births deaths marriages christmas watching the world cup in the pub you know um, we're off, but actually we're often on our guard around that stuff. I mean, apart from resentments, um, which are an internal thing, um, you know, resentments 
are um, the most common cause of relapse, obviously, but all they are is a loss of perspective. Resentments are a loss of perspective. They are your illness trying to pervert the truth to feed the malady. And that's why they're so dangerous. But external triggers, the biggest external triggers, in my opinion, are money and time. Because if you think about it, what do addicts do with money and time? Well, we, we buy drugs and we take drugs, don't we? I mean, that's what being an addict is all about. But what is the nature of the obsession? When the craving gets us is thought one, how can I get the money in order to buy all the drugs I want? And thought two, how can I make them last and how can I have the time to get away with taking them? But then after a few months in recovery, we find that we have more money and time than we've ever had. So then that is the obsession, that obsession that we've always had to try and get the money and time to feed our addictions. When we have money and time, of course, the obsession flips off. Here you go. This is the circumstances that your addiction has always wanted. The bed is made. Go on. You can get away with one little use up if you're careful and the consequences will be minimal. I don't know anyone who has fallen for that lie and not regretted it, including me. So to avoid this, right, I need to change my attitude towards money and time. And I do that by being of service. Now, service is important because it keeps me grounded. Service to the meetings and my fellows who have this illness. But also my performance at work has improved because I serve the big picture of what I'm creating and what we're creating. I don't compare myself to others or sit in judgment. I just try and be as supportive as I can. The way spirituality gets bent out of shape, in my opinion, is if someone reckons they can interpret what God's will is for somebody else. I get the temptation. I, if someone has a profound spiritual experience, why wouldn't you want others to experience the same thing? Well, the issue with that is that that spiritual experience is meant for you and you alone at that specific time. You can't really facsimile it for somebody else. And in attempting to do so, you might even be closing yourself off from your next spiritual experience. So this brings me to the idea that what if enough is perfect? and too much is detrimental. If we take human attributes like confidence and self-assurance, well, they're good qualities in a person, but too much confidence and self-assurance turns into arrogance and conceitedness, and they're not good qualities. So to try and keep my humility and my ego the right size, I try and make sure that I stay in service and keep using the prayer Please remove my difficulties so that my victory over them may be testament to others of this way of life. In other words, I should use my confidence with the responsibility that it is to show those who are afflicted that addiction recovery is possible. If I push my ego forwards and I try and make myself plaud it as Mr. Gold Star Bulletproof Recovery, then my motives have gone astray. In the, in the last couple of years of my using, I was self-centered in the extreme, malicious and manipulative. I have changed, but that was still me. I behaved in that way. I am responsible for terrible things. So I stay, I stay recovered to, if I'm going to stay recovered, then I need to turn that around. So I, I look at any situation today, any topic, and I ask myself one question. Can I help? If I can help, I try. If I can't, I stay out of it. Because the chances are, if I can't help, I've got no business being there. So if you find yourself with time, then that means that someone needs your help. Use it for that. You won't have to look too far. Or, you know, even just when was the last time you went to a meeting outside of your local area to carry your message and get a fresh insight? If you've got time, do that. If you find yourself with money, 
when was the last time you took your mum out for a meal or uh, bought your partner flowers or get that room decorated that you've always been meaning to do? I mean, my mum, my mum loves the garden that I've dug out for her since I've been in recovery. And I used to go around like stationers and buy little colouring books and pens and stuff for my kids and pop them in the post. You know, just little costume jewellery, that, that sort of stuff. Look, what I'm trying to say is that if you use your time and money to show someone else that they are loved, the effect of that will last much longer than any hit. That's what I was getting to. Okay, so regular folk, they do that naturally. Okay, but... Sometimes addicts in recovery, we need to relearn that behavior, and I know I did. So I am a man that has done, in the past, that has done some awful things, right? But I am also a man that has helped many people recover from this illness. I am the man who has given statements to the police about missing addicts and their mental state. I've talked to healthcare professionals who have an, an addict I know in their care. I've stopped an alcoholic from jumping into the sea. I caught a flight to step one someone. Um, I've accompanied guys to their court cases. I drove a mate like 400 miles to a rehab um, to get him in there. That was the only place he could get in. And then I was invited back to that rehab to take that man through his step five. And, uh, and he's still recovered now, years later. Um, I've comforted wives and girlfriends who have had partners fall off the wagon. Um, I've been, I've looked through city streets all night searching for an addict who was threatening to kill himself. Not to mention the countless hours of taking people through the steps and the work and the big book and all that stuff. Now I don't talk about that stuff often, but, but, I'm, but I have done this time um, because that is the other side of what a life in recovery uh, looks like for me and um, you know I mean just just the other day right I, I came across a woman who was drinking vodka in the stairwell of a multi-story car park so I stopped and I talked to her and I offered to take her to a meeting and, and you know and she said she would like to okay so she was obviously pretty pissed she'd made her way down most of that bottle of vodka so I went to my car and I wrote down a reminder for her and I gave her a fiver and I said I'll pick her up at that outside that car park for the meeting the following evening now I went back there that following evening and she wasn't there but that's not the point the delight for me is to find that I don't do these things out of a sense of duty to my recovery or to try and atone for my past. I was just obeying my instincts. I found my true nature through connecting to that higher power of reason and purpose. And I'm really happy to do it. And from now on, I will park on the top floor of that car park and take all of the stairs down just to see if I can see her again. Now, that's what life in recovery looks like. And, but there was a long time where I was in CA and I felt like I was just hanging out here until someone found a proper cure for addiction. But I don't know what a proper cure would look like or what I would want it to do for me. Like, how can you formulate a make yourself normal injection? Or, you know, would it be a brain implant? spirituality plaster i don't know i mean um some kind of pill that says look you can have a fantastic night on three drinks and no more but i have fantastic nights out all the time without drinking at all so i don't even know even if those things existed i don't know if i would if i would want it you know um I mean, if someone did come up with the cure, I'd think about it. If someone did come up with the cure, I'd think about it very seriously, but I think I might be all right where I am. And um, I'll, finish, I'll, 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 finish on this, I'll finish on this thought. There were some times, just some times, when I get life right, 
when the spaces between the planets and the spaces between my molecules are all one and the same, when my higher power is flowing into the spaces between thought and word, flowing into the spaces between feeling and reaction, when there are sparkles of gratitude in every breath for being alive at this present and precise moment, I'm untrammeled by my past and unafraid of the future. It's like sneaking a peek through the keyhole to enlightenment. Now, I'm a long way from enlightened. I'm a billion miles from enlightened, obviously. Like, my hands are way too dirty for that. But it's nice to know that it's there. And I think that's a good place to sign off, Paul. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Eden. Um, yeah, what a phenomenal message. And the transformation. Uh, there was a few things um, that really moved me in your share. Uh, I just want to make a few points for anyone that's new to recovery. Um, we will be putting information up about meetings. We strongly suggest you come along to a meeting. Uh, please reach out to us in the chat below this broadcast. Um, and, you know, there is lots of literature we use, primarily a book called Alcoholics Anonymous, which we call the big book, a chapter of which I've been scrolling through on the screen here. We use another book called The Twelve Steps and Twelve Traditions. Both books can be read or listened to completely free anytime at aa.org. Um, so I'll be putting up more information on the screen in a few minutes. You know, lots of thought provoking stuff. And, you know, and, you know, I could happily listen to you all morning. Um, just beautiful. And the transformation, the change, you know, from obsessing about the next one, where it's coming from, who's got it? Will it be good enough? Will it last? Will it be real? You know, what about after that? You know, the terrible come downs, Eden, you know, uh, the consequences, um, the madness of it, the insanity uh, of being loaded you know, and, and the coming down, the paranoia, you know, and, and it's just absolute insanity. And you said lots of very interesting things. And um, yeah, I mean, just a little bit on, on, on sort of uh, sobriety. It's been really, really good for me, Eden, as well. Um, and, you know, we do talk about God uh, and, and the reality is most people believe, believe in a creator. But I have to make the point, I know people with decades clean that are good folk, but don't, you know, so anyone can get clean and sober in these rooms. You know, the crucial yeah. thing for me is this business of understanding the problem, you know, which I find is an ongoing thing. And I know, you know, like yourself, Eden, we work with folks pretty much every day, uh, you know, for hours every single day. And, uh, you know, we don't take a day off. And on that basis, the idea of learning is very much a current one around step one uh, and the realities thereof, you know, and in our basic text, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, in the, in the doctor's opinion, um, in the first 43 pages, which largely talk about step one, there's about four references to, uh, use a slightly different terms, the mental blank spot, the mental state that precedes a relapse. Uh, the peculiar mental twist and and that you know some people in some belief systems in would say well that's the human condition and they wouldn't be wrong you know but, but for us it's a matter of life and death because you and me don't just want to use on a friday night and then get back to normal living on a saturday morning <laughs> you, you know we want to use all day every day if we can yeah you know and and you know quite honestly you know, who knows, the lurking notion that it does say in our literature is for many alcoholic addicts is that one day they'll be able to beat the game and use successfully without consequences, you know. And, you know, one has to be happy to be sober or perhaps I'll be happy to get drunk or get loaded again, you know. And, and happiness is a daily journey, isn't it? And it's about what we do and finding contentment, you know, and becoming responsible and productive is the deal. But yeah, we do talk, excuse me, we do talk about God a lot, and it is a God of your own conception. And, um, you know, you mentioned some very interesting things, uh, and you met, it was all truth, you know, I, I loved listening to you, and, 
you know, there's human responsibility, there's divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Uh, when we responsibly come to the divine, to the unseen, to the source, and ask for help, we get help. As you said, you know, we ask and we receive, we see, we find, we knock, the doors open to us. It's that simple. But when we choose to reject God, you know, the, the person, the source, the, you know, the, the all powerful unseen one, uh, then uh, he just lets us go on our merry way. We're not robots. We have free will, you know, and the power of choice is restored in recovery. You know, and, and so much is in, in the rooms and you and I know there's a lot of uh, half truths in the rooms of recovery as well. We, we each need to have our own spiritual experience. We each need to work this program, but it needs to be real to us and it needs to be current, you know, and, and that's one of the benefits of, of, of conversations like this, uh, Eden, isn't it? Because we, we connect with others every day you know, and our words reveal our inner life. Uh, and when my words go off key, that means my thought life's gone off key. And it, it, it's not necessarily pleasant at the time, but it reminds you to get back on the beam, you know, to, to get back connected, to get back in the solution. Uh, if I don't have that support network, Eden, if I'm not daily in contact with folk, then I can go straight from wrong thinking to wrong behavior uh, to a wrong lifestyle and could end up using again. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the power of the fellowship. And, and, you know, you and I are part of a group and, you know, there are thousands and thousands of successful 12 step groups on the planet today. And in my experience, God's voice is in all of them, but the great power, I mean, temperance societies have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's nothing new about temperance or abstinence, but for me, it, the principle of one addict helping another is, is somewhat new. You know, in temperance societies in times past, it would be persons that weren't necessarily alcoholic addicts that would be running the show. You know, we, with the therapeutic value of one addict helping another is without parallel, isn't it? And, you know, and then the other feature is the fellowship outside the meetings. You know, we're available to each other outside of the meetings. And it's a really powerful thing. So, you know, um, I mean, in general terms, Eden, you know, you, you work with others and, for me, this business of, of, of the, the mental state that proceeds when people pick up again, well, it, having a, a better understanding of it for me, it affects those that I work with. You know what I mean? Because they sometimes people ring up in a terrible state, you know. Um, uh -huh. and, and so this business of having something to offer them by way of a chink of light into their condition is really 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 important so what, what's your thoughts on that yeah well it's like it's, it's like i said you know i mean and it was a um, and it was certainly um you know massively encouraging to me to hear people share honestly about the problem you know and um be specific about what happened to them and uh, i know that um you know we often try and share really positively about about the solution and I, and I and i tried to do that in this share but um you know in the in the in the previous one like as like i said you know it's i i believe that it is very important i mean if you think about well, really i mean it's amazing that this works i mean how we're uh, groups full of alcoholic addicts who help each other stay off drinking drugs i mean that that's, it seems like an impossible idea really doesn't it but but it does it does work but you know like i said that i i believe that it was a, it was um really encouraging to me to hear people share honestly and be and be specific about what happened to them and how it made them think and how it made them feel and how it made them act when they were in the grips of active addiction, because that solidified for me that I was in the right place, that there were other people like me. And if they were like me and they recovered using this, then it might just be possible for me, you know, and I but I had to have that first. You know, I had to have that first, even though I don't think anyone's ever wandered into recovery by mistake. You know, I, I haven't heard anyone, you know, sort of come into recovery and share, um, do you know what, last Friday night, I took it a bit far, said some things I didn't really mean. I think I need a 12-step fellowship in my life. 
there's normally a greater catalogue of misdemeanors that go, you know, that feed into the idea of needing, you know, of someone needing help, you know. Um, but um, so, yeah, but uh, yeah, so I mean, yes, it is that, um, you know, that was a, uh, that was really important to me to um, have my sponsor share back to me, particularly when we were working through the book the first time, that, um, and for me to believe that he understood exactly what I was going through. And there were many, many people who have and do, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have the advantage of hindsight, don't we? Uh, but, but when we first came into recovery and first tried to quit, we, we, we had a lot of learning and growing to do. And, you know, we're thankful that there was persons that walked this path before us that carried a message of hope, faith and courage with depth and weight, you know, with lots of identification in it. Um, what, what sort of principal elements are essential to long term sobriety, you think? Well, I did a, um, uh, I shared last night on... Um, uh, you know, on the on the principle of willingness. I was a uh, there's a a meeting where they uh, every week they take a different principle and they um, and they they share on on the principles and um, and willingness certainly. You know, I mean, obviously because it was one that I that, that I that I shared upon and there is and and there is courage as well. You know, in there which is really really important. You need you know digging deep and finding a finding a little courage to invest in this um is uh is a really important principle but willingness you know i mean because that's for me that's how it started you know I, it started with the willingness to do things and take action even though i didn't believe it would work you know i did i didn't believe it would work for me you know i didn't i felt like i felt like a total fraud when i was when i was praying and meditating for the first time didn't get it didn't believe it didn't think it would work but i did it anyway and and that's really important to to, to keep on with because i've i've come to realize that um you know fortunately um both my addiction and my recovery have got absolutely nothing to do with what i think and everything to do with what i do absolutely absolutely um yeah, I can, I can relate to that, you know, working working with others and, and, and at, at the beginning, they're not convinced of the verity of the programme, are they? You know, that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's how <laughs> they're not necessarily too keen. Um, but I'll never forget what you told me a year or two ago, Eden. Keep them close, keep the sponsees close, work with them. And, and it's really important. Now, let's face it, you get all kinds of candidates. You you get people that have been clean for a few months but not worked the steps. You might get a man that's fresh out of living out of a spoon half a dozen times a day. You know, you might get someone that's been, uh, you know, that's got a giant hole in the nose and has been snorting two or three hundred pounds worth of cocaine every day for, for months. You know, um, you know, you might get someone that's been living off the foil, uh, you know, for, for years, you know, uh, and, and, and all of the above. So if someone's freshly clean out of like using loads yesterday for a long period of time, you, you've really got to to get them into the literature and, and, and get them into, into their own personal spirituality, their own personal connection with God um, and sort of encourage them with the verities of, of the the 12 steps and the literature and get them to get a home group, you know, and build a support network. Uh, it is doable. It absolutely is. It isn't necessarily easy. You know, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing when we look back, you know, but I'm absolutely convinced, Eden, there's a bigger picture. You know what I mean? That, that, God, that God is already there before we start the steps. I think that's the bigger picture. Um, and you know, seeing people get free, you know, I mean, even in the last year, I've seen marriages healed, you know, I've, I've seen parents get access to the children, have been taken off them by the social services, uh, I've seen people become employable or hang on to their jobs, um, you know, a man, I'm, I've just had, well, we're just about to finish step 12 tomorrow, actually, God willing, um, he has now uh, got more than two years of continuous sobriety and he wouldn't mind me telling you he was in a terrible, terrible state, you know, a really bad way, you know, on, on the crack and the smack. Mm. And uh, it's just a miracle, 
you know, he'd never had a job in his life. You know, he's now got a little van and he's a partner in a little business. Uh, he's got his own obviously responsible and productive member of society. He was in a bad way, homeless, you know, up to all kinds of stuff. You know, and, and, and also I know another man, the same, same situation. So, so miracles do happen and miracles happen in these rooms. And it all starts with that initial willingness, you know. Uh, but as I say, for me, the bigger picture is that God is already there. And, you know, we do talk about God a lot, uh, but we're not a theological seminary. You know, we're not psychiatrists. We're not doctors. Um, and I, I call it the mysteries of recovery, you know, the mystery of willingness. I think after the gift of desperation, we get the gift of endurance, the gift of patience to listen to long winded speeches like mine. <laughs> Um, you know, we get we get the gifts of recovery, don't we? And, and the miracle happens and suddenly we're free. And as it says in the nine step promises, and you know, I used to think about this when I'd be up on the scaffolding, working on building sites, even you'll be amazed before you're halfway through. So I'd sometimes be on a really difficult job and that promise would come to my mind. I think, yeah, just keep on going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that is the miracle of it, isn't it? You know, the transformation. Yeah. 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 And it's, um, and it does, and it, it, it does, it does, but it, it, it's like, it's like you said, you know, um, you know, it, it, it is a simple program and it is available to everybody, but it's not easy. Uh, you know, um, I think it can be, it, it can be a hazard to mistake simple for easy, you know, um, I mean, a really, really, you know, a, a very obvious analogy would be, you know, look at a mountain. A mountain is a very, very simple thing, you know, but you can only climb it by putting one foot in front of the other, you know, um, and, um, uh, you know, and it does, it takes, it takes application, you know, to, um, to, to embark upon a spiritual path of recovery takes, takes application, but it does not, it does not require you to sacrifice anything of your, um, that's you know, right. There's, the, you know, you, do, you, you don't you don't have to make uncomfortable compromises to embark upon a spiritual path recovery. Well, that's right. And absolutely. We we employ our rational faculties. You know what I mean? We, we absolutely do. And the evidence of people that have recovered in front of us in meetings is very strong evidence. You know, and, and I heartily commend face to face meetings. We, we know for the last two years has been a massive influx of members virtually on through Zoom meetings. And that's wonderful. More power to them. In my opinion, this stuff works best face to face. Um, you know, for me, online meetings are, are not a substitute, but a supplement. Um, you know, you can't be seeing recovered addicts in front of you. You know, the power of identification. Um, I mean, the steps are all ancient principles, aren't they? You know, honesty, open mindedness, willingness, transparency, accountability and devotion. You know, um, and, you know, we, they've often used analogies like, haven't they, in the rooms, Eden? I've heard it said, you know, you put half the energy into recovery that you did into scoring, uh, then you will, uh, you will recover. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, uh, yeah, and, it, and, it, and it's very true. But, you, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing about addiction is, is that the, 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 the addiction provides that, to, provides that fire, doesn't it? You know, because it's, because it's, it's on you and it's all consuming. And so the addiction provides that fire and that drive for you to, to acquire drugs, no matter what the cost, you know, as a recovery, you have to find that, uh, you have to find that will, that drive yourself. You know, it's uh, um, and 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 to keep going with it, you know, because uh, you know, for me, I I, I it wasn't it wasn't like I had a choice when I was using, you know, the uh, the, the the end the the end result, you know, the last two years, it was uh, it was utterly hopeless, you know, the there was no there was no controlling him whatsoever, you know, the brake lever had just snapped off, you know, my addiction was a was a total runaway train, you know, I no. I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't d d deal with it in the slightest, you know, whereas, uh, whereas I have to, in order to recover, I have to find that, that, that drive of my, uh, you know, of my own free will to keep doing this. Absolutely. And, and I think getting down to business around consequences is really, really important. You know, uh, you know, a lot of the chaps I've worked with for the first time, very often, you know, making a list of consequences, getting real uh, about their unmanageability, 
it is a huge part of it you know um and, and very empowering you know a honest admission of the realities of active addiction um very beneficial and a great springboard i think step one's a very very important step you know i think it's one that's uh, often too, done too quickly i think it's well worthwhile spending a couple of hours at least um mm. looking closely at step one yeah. uh, you know and it, the transparency particularly persons that you know work in the steps for the first time you know looking at the reality because the the it's it's the inner manageability i know in narcotics anonymous they often spend several months on step one you know um uh, conversely i know people in ca that go through all 12 steps in four hours you know, I like to think four or five weeks or something like that is a reasonable time, unless the person's got more time and more willingness, then you can do it quicker. But the idea is to get persons connected with the God of their understanding, isn't it? To, you know, to become responsible and productive through the spiritual principles. And I, I, I always love hearing, you know, how you bring about the balance between responsibility and accountability uh, and what we do. You know, we live our way into right thinking, you know, and these are like the mysteries of recovery, you know, and, and one can turn them in a thousand different ways. But but basically, we, we, we have a threefold problem, you know, a, 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 we have, how would I, how would I phrase it, um, a disconnection from the source, a disconnection from God, disconnection from the creator, which leads me to wrong thinking, which leads me to wrong practice, wrong lifestyle, a connection with the source, a connection with God gives me right thinking which gives me a right lifestyle but in the midst of that it's it's what i do habitually and regularly that that gives me recovery isn't it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. well that's it i mean we often hear addicts say i learned how to live in this program mm. you know um in the, and that's um you know and that and that is that is that is a lovely simple way of putting um you know of putting what what what's on offer here it sounds you know because it sounds so simple you know it sounds like you know i mean that stuff that i that i, that I said about at the beginning of those things um that you know the the that recovery has given me the material things the outside things that's stuff that wasn't available to me because i closed myself off from mm from being it from being able to have them you know and it's and they are things that people that, do, that don't have the, the the condition of addiction take completely yeah. for granted you know and, and I, sorry yeah yeah no no and, that, and, yeah. and that's it really yeah, yeah. so that, you, you know so people saying you know i i learned how to live in yeah. in in recovery it sounds like it sounds it sounds like such a flippant statement it sounds yeah. like something that could just be that could just be glossed over but actually, yeah. if you look, if you look at that, what that what they're saying is huge. It's, it's it's massive. I mean, human beings are very complex beings. You know, I mean, if we hold that that mankind, that humans are made in the image of a creator, which which, which I of course do, um, then that means we're very very complex. You know, <laughs> and you know that's why we've got a desire to be creative uh, and exert our will. The problem is. That you and me wanted to exert our will getting loaded every day uh, that was the problem you know but we're not bad folk we just had distorted perceptions you know addiction is distortion of perception um you know and, and our world view uh wasn't necessarily a bad one the problem was we wanted to be to be high as a kite you know whilst having yeah. the world view uh, you know the best yeah. men plans of mice and men and um you know, the transformation from being self-serving to serving others is a wonderful thing, you know, to, to have to have various appointments every single day where we're trying to carry a message to others and trying, you know, God gave Bill Wilson great wisdom in the wording of these steps. We try to carry this message. You know, we try to practice these principles. You know, what, what we're up against very often is pride and arrogance. You know what I mean? It's very deluding. Uh, pride and arrogance you know and that's why humility you only get that word once in a word like that indeed in any of the 12 steps in step seven we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings you know that's the, the first step of the second half of the steps so by that time we get through halfway through the steps eden i've got a home group uh, perhaps got a bit of service commitment 
and you know i'm practicing some kind of prayer and meditation daily I, i'm reading at least a couple of pieces of spiritual literature every day i'm practicing good self-care I'm, I'm, I'm working with a sponsor uh, i'm reasonably responsible i'm using wisdom in my day-to-day -day affairs so i'm well on that bridge to normal living by the time i get to step six and i'm presented with my defects of character and my assets of character you know i'm 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 i'm, I'm in the, i'm in the transformation there aren't i you know, and then then I come to seven, and hopefully, there's a little bit of humility and acceptance there, and a little bit of balance. You know, the real gift of the steps is emotional maturity and balance. Uh, you know, which involves a lot of ego deflation, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It does. And and you know, and I was just thinking, you know, I was just thinking that, you know, I mean, one of the things that is. Um, you know, the, the, the nature of, of taking drugs is that, you know, the addiction and taking drugs is, amongst other things, an exhaustive quest for this perfect state of mind. And what we get in recovery is the comfort around um, that there isn't one and um, that we can judge ourselves on the testament of our actions. We can see the evidence of our influence of those we come into contact with whether they're in recovery or whether we're in the outside world or the evidence of what is happening to us as a result of our actions and we become the result of what we do not of you know the condition of the illness and um the more i'm in the more i see that as being that is now more and more and more my reality and i'll try and keep hold of it as best i can you know does that does that does that did that, did that oh, follow? oh absolutely oh absolutely absolutely and you know it's almost like the forbidden fruit isn't it well there's something in this bottle or this bag or this wrap that god's not giving you you know there's something here for you that'll really give you utopia or nirvana and there's something here that'll really help you and you'll just be wonderful and everything will be great. Uh, yeah, it'll probably cost you your life, your wife, your job, your sanity and your health, but it's just what you need. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. you and I can smile about it, but, but you and I know that we work with persons. This is a very stark reality of it. You know, the mental fascination, the obsession, you know, with the first one. Uh, it's a, it's it's a very very subtle temptation yeah, you, yeah. it really is and you know i you know i fairly regularly i you know i get calls of persons in a terrible terrible state even, you know and and it's this it's this thinking that proceeds when they pick up again you know and it's the same thing thinking that dysfunctional thinking that keeps them locked in that cycle of addiction you yeah. know from one yeah. perspective they don't have an alcohol problem they have an alcohol solution. Mm. That's their solution, you know, or a drug solution, you know, to, to, to their circumstances, to their worldview, to how they see things, you know. And, and of course, that's why it's so important to get into a daily program of action, you know, the program in daily activity, isn't it? You know, what we do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, for me, um you know i found that the the, the subtlety of that that, le that led to me picking up was um insecurity in that i was insecure about my own decision making and um i i always felt that if if i made a decision it was probably going to be the wrong decision and i couldn't live with the idea of not making a decision and sitting back and thinking about the idea that making a decision maybe isn't the right thing to do right now um that used to that used to twist me up and if i did make a decision and i was doing something i felt like i was missing out on something that i also could have been doing but i didn't know what that thing was because i hadn't made the decision to do it and that would swim around that kind of that was the condition for me that would make it swim around and around and around in my head when i took a drink or a drug i stopped thinking in that way because there was no point in me trying to figure anything out right now because i would had a drink and so it, it 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 
drinking and using paused those um, impossible questions that I never got anywhere near close to the answer to. And um, and that that was a that was that was what was more often preceded a binge for me than anything else was the insecurity about my own state of mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just been wonderful listening to you again. We, we're almost at the end of today's broadcast. I'll, I'll hand it back to you for a minute or two to summarise for our listeners but i just want to say to anyone new to the channel or anyone that's struggling with drug addiction uh come along to a meeting um get involved you know reach out there's a lot of help available uh you know there's so much really good recovery literature available and available completely free at aa.org you can read or listen to the big book or the 12 steps and 12 traditions anytime uh, on this channel, you can check out the other three dozen or so podcasts and listen to uh, lots of stories, experience, strength and hope uh, and wisdom around the steps and the program of Cocaine Anonymous. Uh, on the screen is a list of meetings. Uh, it's just some of the meetings. There are literally hundreds and hundreds every week. Uh, if you go to those three web addresses at the top, you'll get information uh, about meetings, the address in the middle, the long one, cocaineanonymous.org.uk, will give you information about UK face to face meetings as well as online meetings. Uh, the other two web addresses will give you information about online meetings. You can also read pamphlets and get uh, literature on there as well. Um, in these are British times. If you look at the screen, if you look at the top left underneath the pink box, the Breakfast Club is on every morning at 7 30. Uh, great gratitude at 9.30, pop-up recovery at 10.30. We can recover at the top left at 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. At the top right, daily reprieve, 9.30, reaching out at 11, um, Tazana at midnight. So that's eight meetings that are on every single day. You know, Never be put off coming to a Zoom meeting thinking you'll need to put your camera on. Only about a fifth of the attendees do, nor will you be expected to speak. You know, if, conversely, if you want to share, you, you'd be very welcome to. So please get involved and please reach out. You know, our message is hope and our promise is freedom that an addict, any addict can quit using, lose the desire to use and find a new way to live. You know, Eden, thank you so much for your time this morning. You know, I could, I could listen to you. It's just wonderful wonderful message so i'm just going to hand it back to you for a minute or two to summarize before we wrap things up um uh, uh, yeah super so uh, yeah thank you ever so much I, I i really um you know i'm i'm i really am very 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 grateful for this program i'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to come and speak to you again today um and um you know i i, I love the channel thank you paul for all of the work that you do and the support that you've been to me in this last couple of years um you know with with my recovery um you know um just for anyone who uh, is is listening to this and um you know is maybe new about or is maybe got you know is racked with the same indecisions that uh, that i was shackled to um keep going don't pick up no matter what um everything will be okay don't worry about your life put your recovery first and your life will fall into place behind it um and uh, lots and lots and lots of luck um ask ask for help and then have the courage to receive that help i'll leave it with that Beautiful. Okay, family, thanks so much for tuning in today. Um, yeah, so please come along to a meeting soon uh, and get involved. Okay, that's out for us for today. Um, over and out. Thank you so much, Eden. I'll speak to you soon, my brother. Thank you. Pleasure as always. Cheers, mate. Okay, ciao, ciao.